All right, so to start the notes for 4.7, I'm going to give you guys a chance to um, write out the definitions for the vocabulary because this is important to understanding this lesson, which is about arithmetic sequ sequences. And in this lesson, our objective is to identify and extend patterns in a sequence and also to represent arithmetic sequences using function notation. So what I'm going to ask that you do right now is that you pause the video and you fill out these definitions and once you're ready to move on you resume the video and I'll start going through example one. So for example one we're going to talk about extending a sequence. So a sequence is a, an ordered list of numbers that forms a pattern. So in example one Basically, all I'm going to ask you to do to um, describe this pattern for part A is to just say what's happening between each term. So, to go from 5 to 8, 8 to 11, 11 to 14, you are adding 3. So I would just say add 3 to get the next term. That's the first thing I ask. Second thing I ask, what are the next two terms? So the next term in the sequence would be then be 17. The term after that would be 20. If I'm adding 3 to get the next term, right? In part B, to think about how these are changing, 2.5 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 20, you're multiplying by 2. So I would say, Multiply by 2 to get the next term. All right. So if I keep following that pattern of multiplying by 2, my next term would be 40. The term after that would be 80. So be able to tell a pattern in a sequence and use that pattern to predict the next two numbers or to list the next two numbers. Um, for example two, we are going to be identifying an arithmetic sequence. So an arithmetic sequence has something called a common difference. A common difference is when we have a, an arithmetic sequence, that's the number that is being added and subtracted to get the next term, added or subtracted. So that's gotta be addition or subtraction. So in order for a sequence to be arithmetic, we have to be adding the same term, or sorry, adding the same number each time or subtracting the same number. That same number is the common difference. So in part A, looking at this pattern, the pattern is adding 5. So this is arithmetic. And our common difference, D, I'm going to use the variable D to represent the common difference. The common difference in that sequence is 5. In part B, from first term to second term, I add 3, then I add 4, then I add 4 again. So this doesn't have a common difference because I'm not adding or subtracting the same number to get the next term. So this is not arithmetic. That sequence is not arithmetic. All right. So moving ahead, we are going to talk about writing a rule for an arithmetic sequence, all right? And that's where this little section gives us a little bit of a breakdown of how to write an arithmetic sequence. So we use this function notation, this A parentheses N. N stands for the nth term of a sequence. This A parentheses 1 stands for the first term. N is the term's number, and D is the common difference. So in example two, we're going to talk about how to write something called a recursive rule. Right? A recursive rule is a rule that we use when we list the first term of a sequence and the common difference to say this is how you get the next term based off of the last term. So the recursive rule for this sequence, the things we have to know, we have to know that 
the first term of this sequence is 70. The common difference is 7. So to write the recursive rule for this function, the first thing you list is that the first term is 70. And our recursive rule uses that same notation, a, a parentheses n, which means the nth term. I think of it as our current term. So the notation I use for a recursive rule is I take the last term. So this notation represents the last term. If a parentheses n represents the current term, a parentheses n minus 1 represents the last term. So to get the next term, you take the last term and you add 7 to it. Okay. Now a recursive rule isn't as effective for finding the eighth term. But basically, I'm going to do this recursive rule to help me find the fifth term. So the fifth term is basically me saying, what is the fourth term plus 7? which is kind of annoying, but the fourth term is 91. So 91 plus 7 is 98. Now, using that recursive rule in my head, if I add 7, the sixth term would be 105. Seventh term, 112. Eighth term, 112 plus 7 is 119. So that'll be my eighth term. I don't like using the recursive rule very often because if I need to find a term, I want to have a rule where I can substitute the term, you know, the number of the term into the formula or the function and get out what term I want. So I'm going to show that in the next example, writing an explicit formula. An explicit formula, I think, is the most useful for applications. So in this example, example four, a subway pass has a starting value of $100. After one ride, the value of the pass is $98.25. After two rides, its value is $96.50. After three rides, the value is $94.75. Write a rule to represent the remaining value. So to write that rule first, I'm going to describe this as a function. I always start with the first term. That pass is worth hundred dollars when I start. After I take a ride, obviously the amount on that pass decreases. Well, that's our common difference. So our common difference is how much that ride pass costs for one, or how much that ride pass uses up for one ride. So after one ride, it's 98.25. So I'm going to go over here, I'm going to go 100, 98.25, 96.50, and 94.75. So if I think about it, to find that common difference, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do 98.25 minus 100. And that's really negative 1.75. So that means each ride costs $1.75. So my common difference in this case should be negative because my common difference is decreasing the next term. Okay, It's decreasing the last term to get the next term. So I really want to emphasize how important this is to be able to write these explicit formulas. A parentheses n, so a of n. I say a of n when I see that. That's that function notation. I'm going to start with the first term, 100, plus, and basically what it says is you take n minus 1 times that common difference. So n minus 1 times negative 1.75. And I know that looks a little goofy, but essentially what you're saying is, if I'm figuring out term 1, a of 1, this would be 100 plus 1 minus 1 times 1 1.75. And that should make sense that my first term ends up being 100. To me, the hardest part to get down this notation is this n minus 1 right here. Remembering to write that. The 100 is just term 1. Okay, The one, negative 1.75, 1 
That's our common difference. We got practice identifying those things earlier. So in the last example, example five, I'd like you to know how to convert a recursive rule to an explicit formula. Okay? So this is an arithmetic sequence. It's represented by this recursive formula. A of n equals a times n minus 1 plus 12. The first term of the sequence is 19. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the first term is 19. And then you have to pick out the common difference from this recursive rule. This recursive rule says if you have the last term, you get the next term by adding 12. So my common difference is 12. So my explicit rule or explicit formula is going to be a of n, a parentheses n, equals, and I always start with my first term, 19 plus, plus, and this is always n minus 1 in explicit rules, always n minus 1 times that common difference of 12. And I don't simplify that. I don't distribute. I'm okay with it being in that form, okay? So I may ask you to find, you know, if I ask you to find, find the, I don't know, let's just say you find the 20th term. The way I'd find the 20th term with this explicit rule, I'm going to do this in yellow. A of 20 is 19 plus 20 minus 1 times 12. So to simplify that, the 20th term is 19 plus 19 times 12, which is 228. That added together is 247. So the 20th term would be 247. That's what the explicit rule allows us to do, is to find terms out beyond the first few terms. Okay, so it's a formula. We're going to use these types of formulas in the next chapter to help us write linear functions and graph linear functions. So you're probably ready for the practice. You can move on and get started with that.